Welcome to the Let's Talk About It podcast with your host, Denise. Denise can be found on IamDenise.com and all social media platforms. On Let's Talk About It, we dive into the path along the journey while celebrating the human spirit, resilience, and ability to grow beyond limitations. Are you ready? Okay, then let's talk about it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, Denise. And as usual, I found somebody to talk to so we can talk about (laughs) it and you guys can hear. Very seldom do I get a chance to chat it up with fellow podcasters. And what a way to start than with Eric Brendage. Yes. Welcome to Let's Talk About It, man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate you um, letting me come on your show. I'm, I'm, I just I feel special. I feel special. You know what? You are special. You are special. <laughs> <laughs> so first, let me start with like, how how is um, you, your host of the podcast, Life and Times, mm-hmm. Eric, right? Right. So talk to me a little bit about, I guess, what gave you the idea to start your podcast and what your podcast is about. And then, you know, from listening to my podcast that we're going to talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, what, what made me kind of start it was the simple fact that uh, I always had different ideas, even in college, uh, on how I felt about things or opinionated about things. And I've wanted to share my experiences, things I've learned, things I've read. And I just wanted to just be like, hey, let me just start it. So I started it back in like 14, 15. But the problem is I took some time off at the each season. So I do like a season, which would be like 100 episodes. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, then I would took some time off like a year and a half to start the next season and another year and a half. So I didn't really have a consistency in the beginning. And I think because of that, I am where I am now, but at the same time, I've learned so much. And like with anything, you have to kind of work on what you're doing and be consistent. So if you're listening. If you want to be successful, you got to be consistent. If you're not consistent, you won't be successful. So just That's take that as a key. That's so one of the primary ingredients, absolutely. What, so what's the podcast about? Well, the podcast is now uh, I've honed down after two seasons. My message is mostly about now actionable tips on how you can use to go after your dream job or to go after your entrepreneurship journey. So after the first two seasons where it was just kind of like different different motivation and kind of different topics here and there, I'm starting to hone down more. And I have to say that a lot of times in life, you have to pivot. And when you have to pivot, you got to be able to understand what you're good at where you start drawing to and that's where we're going to that's what season three is about you know actionable tips that you can use today not five years from now but today to change your destination on where you want to go on you know the job you want or the business that you want to start and just giving different tips i have every uh podcast episode so uh, i come on three times a week uh, i have a motivated mondays episode i have a what to do wednesdays episode and a free what knowledge friday okay <laughs> yes what, yes what friday one the free knowledge Friday. See the motivated Mondays. We discuss different topics that you could use, like uh, how to deal with uh, unreasonable employees or coworkers. And then on Wednesdays, we discuss different books you should read or different people you should know. Like one of the books we discussed was the purple cow or Malcolm Gladwell's the outliers book. You know, we need like 10,000 hours to become a, a professional. And then on Friday, I answer questions that people have emailed me or DM me. And I answer them to the best of my ability, just, you know, lead them into the right direction. Cause a lot of times we have questions and we just feel like we can't go to friends and family because we might think they might look at us differently or things like that. But, you know, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm here as a, a good, I call myself accountability type of partner, type of podcast, you know, give you words of wisdom, motivation and to help you. But at the same time, make sure you're still on the right trajectory as we go together to, on our path to success. So. Oh man, I love that. I love that. And it kind of blends me into like my next question, which I know mm. there's so much going on right now in, mm. in today's world and today's society and especially in America. And a lot of times people tend to shy away a little bit from politics. And honestly, typically I don't talk about politics um, here on the show because I tend to focus more so on mental health, personal growth and development, but I can't help but wonder, you know, like what is, you're a, you're a black man in America. Right. What is it like being a black man in America? Like if somebody from another country, you know, asks you that question, like, what's it like being a black man in America? 
Mm-hmm. And I know sometimes when, you know, when that question is asked, we a lot of times people give like a micro versions of that experience, you know, but for you as a professional, mm-hmm. as a person who, you know, kind of embarked in relationship, as a person who, you know, has to kind of operate in a society that's kind mm-hmm. of set up a certain way. What is that journey like for you on a day-to-day basis? Uh, I would have to say it's a, it's a maze. It's definitely a maze because uh, you're constantly always on the defense of things. Being a, being a black man in America, because you don't get the opportunity to walk around with the carefree carefree, carefree shoulders, like some people might do, because you just never know what kind of situations you can, you can go into not thinking about things like a uh, prime example. Uh, let's say, if, let's say I walk in the parking lot. I can't just easily just walk around the parking lot sometimes at nighttime with a hoodie on because certain people might think I'm trying to attack them mm. or I'm trying to do stuff to them. And then they'll, they'll, you know, depend on where you are, People will get frightened. People will do things or, you know, just in general, you know, I don't, I, I always think I, I carry around a good positive energy. So I've been thankful that the Lord has been blessing me not to be in so many crazy situations, but the thing of the matter is it can still happen to you. So even if it's not happened to me, it can still happen to me. So when I see other situations happen to people where they randomly be walking in the parking lot and someone jumps out at them and, and says they, they look like they've, rob somebody or they've been you know they've been a victim people some people will say oh well that's never happened to me but it can happen to you and that's the problem that a lot of people have to realize like you can't just turn your shoulder because it's not you because it can be you and if it does happen to you you still want to support just like you know everybody else so when i see other stuff happen to other people i i i I immediately check it out make sure i have self-conscious see whatever i need to do to help out be support do whatever because it could be me. It could be a future child. It could be anything. And that's the type of stuff that you deal with, you know, being a black male in America. Cause I mean, every day, <laughs> every day you wake up, you have to be prepared that something crazy could happen today. Even when you don't want it to happen, something crazy could happen. You know, I wonder sometimes how does that hypervigilance in terms mm-hmm. of how you have to be kind of like, on alert all the mm-hmm. time in society as a black man in society how does that play out when you're in a more micro system like for example like your relationship right mm-hmm. when you're in a relationship do you find that that hyper kind of awareness sometimes bleeds over into that because if you're if you're used to having to constantly be on the lookout, you know, mm-hmm. and be extremely aware of your circumstance. Have you ever found a situation where you've had to kind of check yourself because you realize that some of that is kind of bleeding into relationships or into other dynamics that's outside of like the macro society role? Uh, I think, honestly, that's always going to be a yes. Cause mm-hmm. even, even if you, after you check yourself, it's still going to happen because like I'm, I'm hyper paranoid, like hyper paranoid, like to the, to the point of paranoid, like if I'm driving and the same car goes through two lights with me, I'm thinking that they're coming to get me, follow me or whatever. I'm hyper paranoid. And that's not even hyper paranoid of like, say the police, I'm just hyper paranoid in general because I just been in too many situations where you know, people have let their guards down and and stuff has happened to them or they let their guards down with other people around and people have attacked them. You know, you, you, we've, we've gotten to the point now, how do I say this? Where people will do things to you just because you look different. Mm. And because of that, you really have to be on guard at all times because I'm not saying it's going to happen to me. God forbid, I hope it never happens, Mm -hmm. but you you, 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 you pick up your phone. All it takes is a couple of minutes on social media for you to see a video of someone being like, I literally just left my house and someone yelled at me. And then all of a sudden a barrage of attacks came at me, or they went to a parking lot and they, they drove in front of somebody and then someone chased them down in their car. 
and they had paid no attention. And then they part and that person jumped out of that car, ran over to them and punched them or just all of a sudden pulled a weapon on them and they didn't expect it to come. You know, and it's that whole you got to keep your head on a swivel type of situation. And I don't think that's just even for me as a, a black man, but I think for just anybody in general. But majority, it could be minorities because, you know, my, I see a lot of minorities getting attacked and stuff like that. But it could be just in general for everybody. You know, you got to keep your head on a swivel because people nowadays are doing stuff that just it's, it's getting escalated. And to go back to your point, yes, it, it will bleed into relationships because, the simple fact that all the time you have it on your mind, you have all the time you thinking about it. So sometimes it's hard to turn it off. And because it's hard to turn off, it sometimes goes into it. But, you know, you kind of realize like, hey, I, that's why a lot of times people's houses should be your safe space. And that's why a lot of times people um, things when people. OK, you ever heard people use the saying like. This is my feng shui. When I come home, I like to be at peace. And those are the reasons because they feel like there's so much going on outside the world that when they do come home, they want to be at peace. They want to be feel like they can be themselves, let their guard down, don't have to worry about someone attacking them or coming out the bushes or running through the hallway trying to get them or say that they fit the description of somebody. What's the psychological toll that you feel like that hypervigilance has taken you know, on you? even in a workspace, for example, because we're, we're talking about, you know, the hypervigilance that you have to have when you're right. like just up and about out in society on a day-to-day -day basis. How has that transferred into other areas of your life and especially in the corporate space, because I know that you have a corporate background mm -hmm. and what are some of the psychological tools that, this experience has had on you and is happening on you? I, I think psychologically, it kind of just makes you aware that a lot of people say things that they don't know could be because could be racist or they or they're not even thinking about it being racist because where they come from, it just seems like normal comments. Mm. But it's not normal comments, you know, and it doesn't even have to be anything pertaining to you or a person. It could just be stuff that they say out loud about other people or other things and they think it's okay, you know? And I think you kind of become desensitized after a while because you start realizing like some people are just gonna be themselves and they don't care about how other people feel. And, you know, working at different corporate backgrounds, you know, all over the place, you know, you kind of learn different li lingo, different, you know, words and things like that. Like a uh, like prime example, like I was living in um, Atlanta and mm -hmm. coming, going to Atlanta and, you know, it's always great because I see a lot of people like, you know, minorities, African-Americans being successful is great. I love that. And, you know, in Atlanta, when you don't get a job, they always say if someone they, they don't want to hire you, they'll say you're you're uh, overqualified or, <laughs> you know, you might make too much money or, you yeah. know, they'll say stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, but I went to school in Mississippi and then Mississippi, if they don't want you to hire us, you'd be like, we don't feel like you, you fit around here. Oh, wow. It just it just point blank to the point. They'll they'll say stuff like that. Like, yeah, we don't think you we don't think we you'll be a good mix or you're not what we're looking for. You know, things like that will be said. I've, I've heard, right. you know, things like that. And it's like, <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? And, and you just learn like when I went out there and people used to be like, oh, you're overqualified sometimes. And they, and and I would know what it mean. I'm like, it wouldn't even bother me because I'd be like, I would know what they mean, but they're just being in a nicer way. So after a while being in Mississippi and hearing certain stuff, you'd be like, well, you just become sensitized. Like, well, I guess this is a better way than them saying, hey, we just don't, we don't like how you, we just don't think you look, we just don't think you'll fit in here. You know, you look at our staff, then look at you. We don't think you fit in. Like, <laughs> So, but I, I mean, under, that's the undertone of the conversation. Yeah, that's the undertone of the conversation. So, yeah, look around, look at you. I don't know about you, buddy. I don't think you'll fit in around here, buddy. Like, um, wow. Like, and that's the type of stuff that, that happens. Like, it still does happen in Mississippi. Things like that happen, like, literally. So, it's, it's, it, it kind of makes you to the point where you just be like, it is what it is. Because some people don't ever want to change. Some people don't want to think outside the box. Some people don't want to feel like there's, they should be given the opportunity. Some people just feel like, you know, you don't look like me. I don't want you. I don't want you around. And that's just how it is. I mean, but 
I say all that to say at the end of the day that the thing that really boils me down, <laughs> and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. I, I don't like it when people act like that, mm. and then they say they're a Christian. Oh, honey, you know what? Let's take a break on that. <laughs> you do not want to get me started. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We are talking to the host of the podcast, The Life and Times of Eric. We're going to take a break. You are listening to Let's Talk About It, and we'll be right back after these messages. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Let's Talk About It. I am here with the host of a podcast called Life and Times of Eric, and we are really just talking about it because this podcast is Let's Talk About It. So we're talking to Eric. Today's episode is pretty much all about Eric and his experience and, and his life. And so before the break, she's like, talk about a cliffhanger. You were talking about how, you know, how it bothers you and boils mm -hmm. your blood when people um, act a certain way, you know, like with bigotry and yep. then say that they are Christian. Yep. You know, that's that's the area that I relate to because I find that a lot of times, not saying everyone, but a lot of times when people say they're Christian, it is so their example or their actions can sometimes be so opposite of what the Christian philosophy is supposed yep. to embody that it is just downright hypocritical. And yes. Christianity for black people in general is something that is extremely important and extremely you know like this is what we we live by our faith mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about you and your spiritual orientation and i don't know if you're christian or what your belief is in god or yeah. you know but so tell me a little bit about like your spiritual orientation yeah definitely uh i definitely consider myself a child of god uh definitely believe in Jesus Christ, you know, God saved me, reborn again, all that. I believe everything because, I mean, I've just seen all the miracles he's worked through in my life. So anytime something happens to me, you know, it's because of God, you know, God is good all the time. And I guess it just makes me aggravated because like you said before, I, I see people like prime example, like Clemson's coach, Dabo Sweeney. He, he says he's a Christian, but then when the whole incident was happening with Black Lives Matter and people were dying, he was like, if they want to kneel, they should take that somewhere else. Why are they doing that? There's no point in them even kneeling. It's like you you, you claim to be a Christian, but if you're a Christian, then you understand that persecuting of, of people is not what you want, meaning that people are getting hurt. That's not what you want. As a Christian, you should be supportive of certain Black athletes feeling that, you know, we're being, you know, jeopardize or we're being targeted you should be understanding you should be supportive not telling them they're not going to do that here they want to do that they should go somewhere else that's not being a christian christians is considered in the bible being supportive of others being understanding and that's being understanding at all and i just don't understand those type of things because i just feel like you know reading and then having faith me saying that i'm a, a child of god when god tells me that i should love my brother like myself and me saying that I hate you or I don't like you because you're different from me, that doesn't make me a child of God. It makes me the complete opposite. I'm being a, a hypocrite because I feel like that or I don't like you. And I just don't, I just don't resonate with that. I don't get, I don't get it. And I, I, I never will like it because it, it aggravates me when people go around throwing around saying that. And like you said before, it makes people feel uncomfortable. You know, I think it's so much easier for people to say they are something than to mm. actually be the thing, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So easy to basically just take credit or wear a label, but how you live your life and how you treat others and the discipline and the structure and the commitment and the Christ-like essence is harder to demonstrate on a day two because, you know, we're not perfect. We're all, you know, a work in progress and we're all yeah. learning, but we should at least try to embody the principles of whatever religious practice we have. And it's sad to say that a lot of people who cling to certain religious practices just don't embody that, you know, behavior in their day to day lives. So I, I hear you on that one and I feel your point. Um, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit. I'm going to get mm -hmm. all in your business because, you know, I already told you before you came on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to do. 
So let's go to your your personal life a little yeah. bit. So earlier you mentioned that you don't have any kids. So are you hmm. single, dating, married? What's your what's your your status? Uh, I'm married. Okay. I, How I long have you been married? Uh, June will make a year, so it's new. Okay. It's new. How is it going? It was great. I mean, I enjoy it. Like uh, my significant other or my half, my wife, she's, she's wonderful. She's very supportive in everything I'm doing, like speaking on podcasts and she, awesome. she listens to me and stuff like that. So she's like, yeah, go and do it, do it, do it. Go. You know, you like, have a winner because she listens to your episodes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She listens to my episodes. She, she gives me her, her, her feedback, her, her, her critiques. Uh, and uh, she just, she's real supportive. So I couldn't ask for anybody else because some people don't listen to the podcast, but to be able to have somebody that, that does is, is very supportive. Oh, and that's dedicated and committed. Before you got married, what are some of the challenges you found dating? And I'm asking this because I think a lot of times the, the, the point that mm-hmm. you know men present is like, oh, women are this, all oh, women are that. Why do women got to be this? Why right. women are that? That. And it's like said in like a problematic way while they're mm-hmm. in the space. So it's not objective. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> you found your queen. And so yeah. you're, you know, you're married and you're happy. But looking back, what are some of the difficulties you found within the dating experience um, when you were single? Right. I would have to say my dating experience was kind of all over the place. Mm-hmm. Because since I'm a military brat and my, my parents are like in the Air Force, I've dated a, a, a multitude of different type of females, like from different shades, black, white, whatever, mm-hmm. Korean, whatever. And I say all that to say, like, the dating world is different because I feel like it changed over ages. Because mm-hmm. when I was dating, it was, you know, you were, I would get your phone number. I, we would talk on the phone. We would talk on the phone. Good course. And then, yeah, you were court, you know what I'm saying? We were talking on the mm-hmm. phone, things like that. And then now it started getting me, now it started going from talking on the phone to now we're texting and not talking on the phone. And <laughs> to now I don't have to do anything but just open up my app. And then after that, it's just like, I don't even have to have no real conversation. It's just texting all day. And the whole aspect of real communication is gone. And a lot of times you don't really know if a person can hold a conversation to keep your attention or to keep your span or, you know, just the ability to get to know you. You know, when I was coming through, it was like, can you talk on the phone? Because that was the majority of how you're going to, you know, things are going to happen get now. To know somebody. Yeah. Get to know somebody. Now it's like, Hey man, all I can do. So I, I like, I have like, uh, like my, I like my, my, uh, I'm in fraternity. So like I have younger Neos and now they've like, yeah, dog, I'll do just text all day. I was like, so y'all never talk on the phone. Nah, I just text old girl. We just text all day. I like, I just never knew you could just That's get to know thing. somebody through all texts and nothing. Like only That's time we get thing. up. Yeah. Only time we get up is when, you know, it's time. I was like, wow. I just, <laughs> you know, that's, you know, but before it was all talking on the phone. So. What made you marry your wife? What was it that made you decide that, you know what, this is the woman that I want to marry and this is the woman that I want to spend the rest of my life with? I had to say like her her love for God, like she had a strong relationship for God. It it was first in our heart. And I believe that's what you want. Uh, And I say, believe that's what you want in the sense where that's what I wanted because I wanted somebody that's going to have a strong belief because I've I've been without my faith and it's it has been a rocky road it's been up and down it's been you know times I just wanted to just throw the towel in literally just be like I'm just I'm done with this I don't want to do nothing else but when I got aligned with my faith and started becoming understanding you know tithing more reading more becoming more loving of other people and not just thinking everything was about me and start trying to take 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 and give 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 I started Mm -hmm. realizing that it's a very important important and she had a lot of those uh she had a lot of those traits she loved the lord she she was all about like what's important and she had ambition that was another second thing a lot of females that i talked to before i even told her i didn't have ambition it was always about you know it is what it is you know i i I don't know i'm just kind of taking it day by day but she 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 thought big and a lot of times i didn't think big and she used to think big so much that it it made me feel cool like 
this is possible. I never would think like this, but to see you thinking big and talking big is like, yeah, I want to, I want to be a part of this and, and get on this boat. So those are definitely two of the most important things. Then on top of that, she's uh, real good with kids. And I was like, Hey, if I ever have kids, she'd be good. Then she's good with doing taxes. <laughs> and I thought that was real cool. I don't really know do, too well about doing my own taxes. So it was stuff like that, that, that just really made me just be like, yeah, this is, this is it. Then she's really, I would have to say she's really caring and understanding. Cause sometimes it could be difficult dealing with me at times, but uh, she's, she's very understanding to that. So I, I love her for that. I think those are all like really, really, you know, good, sound, solid, traits that you identified recognized mm -hmm. and essentially those traits were the traits that you wanted and the traits that mm -hmm. you needed and so you kind of started out with faith and I don't think a lot of people include that in to their their search for a partner mm -hmm. what is it about the idea of a woman loving God what what is the message in behind that because you said you know she loved god so mm -hmm. what does that what is in that message that you saw that was mm -hmm. kind of like symbolic well i think once once again it's like before her when i didn't have a plan or i didn't know what i wanted i didn't i wasn't aligned with my faith i had a lot of things i wanted that just didn't make sense like my list before then was just horrible and then it, it it wasn't i wasn't getting horrible women because the, the the women i dated before were great women as well but it just it it was leaving me kind of wondering like what am i doing and you have to check yourself because a lot of times people get in relationships and they don't have them their own selves checked as to what they want and because of that they end up being feeling like no i'm never happy you're not happy because you're not happy. You need to check yourself first. So I had to check myself first. And then once I started getting in tune, I realized why faith was important. Because when I had met her, crazy enough, I had just been laid off of my job. And I was like, literally, like I had got a severance. And I was like, you know, I always told myself I wanted to get closer to the Lord. I was like, hey, right now would be the best time. I got laid off. I got a severance. So I just spent all my time reading and going to, going to church. I, I went from one, one day of church to going on Wednesdays, serving at the church, you know, because at that time I didn't have myself together. So when I started getting myself, I didn't have myself together. And the best way to get myself together was to go to go to church more and help out, you know, just take my mind off things and, and give back. Like I once said, stop trying to take, take, take and give, give, give and help others. And then the process of helping others is when I ran into her. And, and it showed me like, hey, like having the ability to have someone that has faith in life in the sense where you're going to have more trials and tribulations, but to have somebody else that also believes that the Lord can get you through it. And that if you pray, things will get better. And if you tired, that you'll always be blessed. That's what you want. Instead of someone being like, nah, that's dumb. Why are you trying to pray that it, the Lord don't hear you? You don't need that, which I have heard from people before. Mm. So you, you gotta, you gotta be able to understand like what's best for you. And in, in the, in the sense of some people that might not be what they want and that's fine. But everybody's different. And that's just, I just knew that at the time, what I had gone through, that's what I wanted because I knew that in life, there's going to be more, you know, ups and downs. And to be able to have somebody that's going to pray for you and constantly keep you in prayer and be like, did you read? Did you pray today? It, it, it'll help you out. And that's why I need it. You mentioned something earlier as you were kind of talking about finding yourself along the way. You said mm -hmm. you have to check yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really hard for people to do. And I don't want to say hard for men to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's definitely hard for men to do. Definitely. <laughs> it's not me. It's them. It's not me. It's them. No, bro. It's you, bro. It's you. <laughs> I will um, ask my question. I think sometimes it is challenging and difficult for men to check themselves because mm -hmm. of the ego piece. And women have that too. I'm not being sexist. What is it that you think makes it so difficult for a man to sometimes really evaluate himself and where he is, where he isn't, what his expectations are, what his standards are? Because I feel like a lot of times 
people like avoid that conversation, maybe because it's too real, it's too raw, yeah. it's too honest, it's too vulnerable. I mean, all of the above. Mm-hmm. What do you think the struggle is with checking yourself and how were you able to do it? I think the struggle is with, uh, you know, like Ice Cube said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. I think the problem is that people don't do it because people don't want a reality check. People don't want to admit to the flaws that they have. And until you're able to admit to the flaws that you have, that's how you, you're not going to be able to be able to re- reality check yourself. And I was able to reality check myself because I was like, what am I doing wrong? How did I get to this situation? What did I do to put myself in this situation? And once I sat back and realized it, I was like, yep, yep, I did that. I did that. I did that. Yeah, I definitely should have did that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should have been, you know, I, I, you know, and also being able to leave. You know, that's part of also the reality check. Sometimes you don't know when to leave a situation. You're too comfortable. You think you think that the next situation won't be as good as what you're having. So you got to be able to kind of, you know, leave a situation or know that, you know, this isn't helpful for me. And sometimes I might go on this journey alone. So that dealt along, that dealt with, you know, being able to check myself. And like you said before, uh, the whole, make, make a long story short, being able to spot your flaws, come to realization with them and saying, this is what I'm doing wrong. How, what do I need to do to, to fix them? And it could be eternally. It could be stuff in your childhood. It could be anything, but just being able to realize what your problem is and want to work on it. A lot of people don't want to work on their problem. They just want to point fingers to other people and be like, you made me act like this. No, something in your past or something you've happened has made you act like this. So. And therapy plays a really, a really strong role mm. in, some of those conversations and reflections, you mm-hmm. know, that we can have with ourselves. But, you know, research shows that minorities are less inclined to go to therapy than yep. their non-minority counterparts. Have you ever had a situation where you thought about going to therapy? And what's your take as a Black man? Yeah. To th- well, I, I think... When it comes to therapy, I think if, if you need therapy, you should go. Have I ever thought about going to therapy? But I have, it has crossed my mind a couple of times in the sense where like when I was in a slump and I was kind of wondering like, you know, why am I feeling like uh, things aren't going my way? And sometimes, you know, talking to somebody I, and, and let me let me make sure I uh, uh, um, explain ther- explain a little bit more. Whenever people hear therapy, they always think it means there's something wrong with your head. Or you can't do something. People don't realize there's different types of therapy. Right. Yeah, or you're crazy. Yeah. yeah, there's there's different types of therapists. There's a career type of therapy where somebody can show you like why you feel like you're in the funk with your career. There's a personal. There's there's different types of therapy. So let me make sure I say that to people because people just think minorities think when I say therapy, oh he he gone off in the head. He got issues. No, there's different types of therapy. Right. So I did I did think about like like a career therapist in the sense where like. What do I want to do? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what the, what my journey is. What do I like? Because, you know, it's just like a midlife crisis. I didn't have one, but, you know, you could have those with your career because you feel like you thought you wanted to do something for so long and then you realize that's not what you want to do. So to, to make a long story short, I feel like if you need to go to therapy, because I, I know people who have gone, there's nothing wrong with that. You need to make sure you get the right help so that your, your whole psyche, your mind and your body could be better. And if, have I thought about it before when it came to my career? Yeah, definitely. I thought about going to a career therapist to kind of just help me, you know, isolate and figure out where I need to go on my career path and what I like and, you know, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Well, I'm an advocate of therapy, um, all shapes, forms, mm-hmm. and, and types. And I think, you know, if someone needs the help that they should go and people shouldn't make them feel bad about going. And you're mm-hmm. right, there is this assumption or sometimes this false narrative that, hey, if you're going to therapy, something's really, really wrong with you. And in fact, there's not one person that I've ever met that I couldn't see where some type of therapy could be beneficial. And like mm-hmm. you said, maybe you end up going to therapy and you end up talking about you know, your career funk or you wanted to make a change and the trepidation yep. that comes with that or recognizing some of the things that still drives you know, your actions and behaviors from childhood Mm -hmm. so you know I'm happy to hear you say that you know what I think this is something that people should do I've thought about it on some scale and um 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy when it becomes a natural part of people's process. Like, hey, if that's something you need, you know, go do it. Yeah, oh. I mean that definitely because I know before I got married, I went to therapy with my wife. We went to, I guess, the couples therapy to talk about everything, and mm -hmm. that's therapy. See, that's therapy as well because a lot of people. Just be like, we're getting married. Well, we need to go, to go talk to something. No, we're not doing none of that. We're not doing no premarital counseling couple up there. Some people don't do that. They just get married. But we went through it. And I, I, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I I mean, my wife would be joking on me all the time, but I enjoy talking about what I feel like was the issue because then I have a bi biased person to be like, yes, he does make a valid point. Thank you. <laughs> and I think anybody that's listened, if you or dealing with anything psychologically, please get help because you are important to somebody out here. So make sure you take care of your, your mind, spirit, and body. Mm, I love that. I love that. So perfect segue to go to a commercial. We are going to be talking a little bit more about the mind, spirit, and body. Off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are talking to Eric, the host of Life and Times of Eric podcast. And we'll be right back after these messages to continue this conversation. You're listening to Let's Talk About It. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Let's Talk About It. I'm here with the host of Life and Times of Eric podcast. And we're basically just talking about it. We're talking about his life, talking about his experience as a Black man living in America today. And we've mm -hmm. talked about um, spirituality, we've talked about um, the tenets of life. And so I want to transition a little bit into your professional life and your career and what you do and how you kind of got to where you are now in the line of work that you're in. Uh, I th it, it, it's actually kind of crazy because I went to school and I got my MBA to be like a sports agent. And then I got a job uh, working for a sports team, didn't like it. And then I went to project management, travel for about like, did that for two, and a year, two years and just traveled, tra kind of traveled around. Like the whole time I worked there, we traveled eight months out of the year. So that was kind of cool, you know, but then it kind of wears its course. And then from there, I was like, let me try startups. I always wanted to try. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the startup culture, I don't know if people know, but you see the you see the reports is exactly what it says. There's not that many minorities, so a lot of times I I start off at the bottom, start off at the bottom position, and then kind of earn my way up like with more experience. And a lot of times I may have been the only black male there, uh, with everybody else looking the same. And you know I just kind of went from there. Then I went out to Silicon Valley, worked at a startup, only black guy there once again, uh, came back, uh, worked at another startup, and then now I'm at another one. And I just feel like everything happened because at one point I transitioned like from wanting to do corporate America mm -hmm. to do startup America. And then I left corporate America, went to startup and then left startup, went back to corporate America and then realized like, I don't know about this. This might not be for me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and then I went back to startup, but I say all that to say, no matter where you go, <laughs> Just make sure that you, you, you go. And uh, I say it like that because a lot of times I've ran into people who wanted to, who wanted to try something different, but were nervous and were scared. And I think the, the hindrance of other people around them and what they might think stopped them from trying different things. And I'm, I'm in the field now because I was able to walk on faith, even when everybody else was around me was telling me like, you know, you've had a bad experience with other startups. Don't do it. But I, I couldn't let the bad experience from the past stop me from, you know, doing what I'm doing now. And, and, it, and it's been great. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> walk on faith and don't let other people stop you from doing it. So that has been my journey. It's been all over the place. It's not been locked in or honed in. I kind of wish it had been because then I'd, I'd have a bit different type of um, aspect or experience. But to be perfectly honest, it's been all over the place. I mean, now it's cool. But at the time when I'm going through all the different things, you know, the being laid off, uh, working different jobs that are crazy, it wasn't cool then. But now it's like, hey, I did that. I could do anything. So, you know. Because it's, it's been a part of your journey, right? Yeah, it's definitely been a part of my journey because you got to think about it. You, you, when you do the corporate culture, you know, it's a certain type of aspect. You know, this is what we do. This We have a handbook. This is how we function. This is this. When you do the startup culture, it's 
What's the handbook? Handbook? Nah, man. Just, just, this is, you know, just what we doing, man. What we doing? Is that beer over there? Yeah, man. Beer at twelve o'clock. It's all good. It's, it's cool, man. It's cool. It's cool, bro. It's cool, man. Is that a gun on your desk? Oh, man. It's all right, man. It's, it was just in the office, man. Ain't there no problems around here. Like, is this what we doing out in California? Like. <laughs> But uh, I'm serious, like literally, I've walked into people's desk office and they've had a gun on their desk. Like, like hey. bro, what are you? So that's why I said it, it's a different type of intertwining type of thing. You know, corporate is boom, 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 boom. Mm-hmm. Startup is dun 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 dun. You you don't know what you might get. You know, startup is startup fits what it says. If you don't fit the culture, they will let you go. I've seen it happen too many times. Mm-hmm. So. What are some of the obstacles that you've had, you know, along the way? I mean, you've had a very interesting kind Mm -hmm. of life. What do you think some of the biggest obstacles um, were that you faced throughout your life? Uh, The the first biggest obstacle being Black in America is is a very big obstacle. That's every day because you got to deal with a lot of people who are just foolish minded and they don't know me and they think I'm trouble. Uh, I would say the second obstacle would probably be like getting into grad school. That was a big obstacle because, you know, you got to be great at taking these tests. And if you're not that great at taking the test, then you have to take a lot of time to study. Mm. And it it, it could just be a, a pain. And it wasn't like how it is now. Now it's like, you could just do it online. Back then it was, we're only going in the classroom. I wish I could do it online now. I would literally sit at home and just do it online and save that money. So I would have to say that was one of the big obstacles. Um, when I got laid off, uh, it was just like, have you ever seen the movie Friday? I was just like Craig. I got laid off on my day off. <laughs> yeah, that was like, <laughs> that was literally like I had, I took off. I went to my homecoming for my university. My school came back. Start getting all these phone calls. I'm like, why are they calling me? And then picked up my supervisor, like, yeah, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, I was like, man, are you laying me off? Yeah, man, you're the last one hired. So, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, at, at first I was mad and, and I'd never been laid off before then. So it kind of like makes you feel like, what did I do wrong? But at the same time, though, I had been wanting to leave my job anyway. I've been looking. So it was just like, I got a free vacation. They gave me a severance. So I was out of there. I mean, you know, even when I had to turn my computer in, they were like, what's your password to your computer? I was like, I hate my job. And it was like, what? I was like, yeah, I hate my job. That's my password. So it was, it was pretty much the Lord's like, Hey, you've been looking to leave anyway. Let me give you a little, let me give you a little something to give you a little push to go do something else. So I wasn't mad. I mean, I was mad at the time, but I wasn't mm-hmm. mad. But this is another thing I'm going to, I'm going to tell everybody, bring it on back. Um, when the Lord speaks to you or you have a, a discernment, listen to it. Because at that time I wasn't in the faith. Uh, I wasn't praying. I wasn't tithing like I was, but I heard the Lord distinctly say to me one day, like, Hey, you need to build up your savings even more. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's just really crazy. And I didn't know what I know now, but if I knew what I knew back then, I could have did it a lot better and not had to work so hard. I ended up picking up two more jobs and save it up and get it higher. And the same day that the Lord told me that, the year later, I got laid off on that same day. Mm, wow. So when I had got laid off, I already had a whole year saved up of all bills. And then I got the severance. So I was literally like, you wouldn't even know when I had lost my job. I was, I was still going on trips. I was like some of these social media people. You think I was living good. And got, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> so I say all that to say, if you hear somebody or you have a feeling inside you that's telling you to do something, it's probably the Lord speaking to you. You just not know what the voice is. So make sure you listen and, and act on it. Listen and trust that, right? Because mm-hmm. it's, trust it's it. always a little voice that's there. And I think sometimes we just don't really listen to it. At all, at all. Yeah. What role did your parents play in the man that you grew up to be? Oh, man, I, I would have to say my parents played a, a huge role. And so did my big brother. I have a big brother as well, too, like, um, which is kind of crazy because I'm the younger brother, but I'm bigger than him. My brother's like six, two. And I'm I'm like, what, six, four and a half, two forty. So, you know, I'm pretty much bigger than him and everything. But and my dad, he's like six, two. My mom's like five, eleven, wow. six foot. Yeah. So like they all they all played a, like they said before, it takes a village to raise a child. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, being the youngest, they definitely played a, a big factor. Like, um, and I'll say this is like, as a parent, when you do have kids, like I know you have some and they, anybody else is listening, tell your kids things that they should do over and over again. And even when they don't see it, sometimes direct their steps because they may not see it, but they'll be thankful for you. Prime example, when I was going through school, my dad was like, you need to take a typing class. I was like, man, I'm not trying to take no typing class. That's boring. I want to take a drama some class so I can hang out, talk all day. I'm not trying to take no typing. Little did I know he was right because I went to college and I knew people who couldn't type and they doing this for th- for 12 page papers. And because I took a typing class that uh-huh. I took back in 11th grade, I'm able to, I'm even to, yes, yes. I'm typing up a pro, literally not even looking. I'm over here talking, uh-huh, what are y'all talking, uh-huh. And that's because he told me to type the typing classes. He made me take it even when I didn't want to take it. Another thing also, my dad, he got his MBA from Oklahoma and uh, he got his undergrad from Alabama State. And he was like, you need to get your MBA. You need to get it. It's going to help you. It's going to help you. I was like, man, I don't want to do that. But he kept saying it so much that I was like, I'm going to go get it. And it did help me. It showed me a lot of school education and then mixed with life education. But if he hadn't been putting it in my mind, I would have never gotten to get it. And I say all that to say that your parents can make a difference on your trajectory, your course, because my mom pushed us to, you know, work on civil service. And my brother went and got a civil service job and he's living lavish, you know, doing an HR type accounting stuff for the government. He's living good. But if my mom would have never pushed us towards that or showed us like this is a good route to have for your job or your career or things like that for your skills, we wouldn't have never known about that. And as a parent, you know you know, you direct your kids towards where you want them to be successful. And you kind of put that in their ear. If you don't put them in the ear, they, how would they ever know? Last but not least, I want to say this. My parents got me into stocks and trades and bonds because they used to talk about that type of stuff. And I didn't know about it. So they're like, well, you know, we got our 401k and we got these stocks. You should think about checking out the stock market and this and that. But if they would have never told me, I would have never known. So they kind of they introduced me to those type of things and being financial and having literacy and, and all that above. You know, I wish that I could just like do a podcast episode every day and just talk to people that really just live in their life, doing the best they can, working with what they have, Mm -hmm. you know, taking experiences from their childhood, young adulthood, and incorporating that with the lessons they learned along the way from their parents and from the members Mm -hmm. of the village that it takes to raise a child. And I think a lot of those conversations I find particularly interesting because that's what people learn from. Yep. And, you know, we're unfortunately in a culture where you have to be doing something drastic to have a platform to share your life and share your experience. And I think that's why we have the society that we have today, because we don't mm-hmm. have enough people that's just really having conversations about day-to-day experience, because that's where you pick you know, you get the meat from. That's where you're Mm -hmm. able to identify things within yourself that you recognize with others and take advice or just feedback or have exposure to, you know, a different frame of reference. And, you know, I I, I really want to have more of these episodes in, in my podcast. And I'm glad that you, you know, carved out the time to stop by and chit chat. And it was like such a pleasure talking to you. It was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think you have a lot to offer and a lot that you can share. And I see now why you have the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say like, you just, you, you, you have so much, you know, experience in life and also so much that you want to share with people and you have you know, so much on your heart and so much on your mind. And one of the great things about doing podcasts is you get a platform to do that. Yep. So yep. I want to thank you so much for stopping by to talk mm-hmm. to me. And um, I know I'm going to have you come back on one of my oh, yeah. discussions. Um, as you know, I know you always. have an opinion on a lot. <laughs> yeah, always, always welcome to come back. Always, always. So, um before we go usually when i have these kind of conversations i i give the guests an opportunity because they're like you asked a lot of questions we need to ask you a question so do you have any questions for me or are we good (laughs) i guess my question for you would be 
is I know before, like, when did you know that you wanted to start your podcast and where, where did you get the motivation for you to start it? Was it from the kids? Was it from your background? Was it from like, you know, your upbringing? Like, how did that come about with you? Because, you know, it takes a lot to start a podcast because everybody talks about doing some, but doesn't mean they do it. <laughs> you know, it's weird. I feel like my life in general is a podcast. It's just not being recorded. You know, <laughs> like when I'm having conversations with my sister or with my clients, people are constantly saying to me, oh, my gosh, can I write that down? Or, oh, my gosh, how did you come mm. up with that? Or, oh, my gosh. And, you know, for a, for a while, I just felt completely fulfilled with just mm. sharing those, you know, eureka moments, right. you know, with my clients and with my family or peers. And they really kind of encouraged me, like, you should really look into how it, having a podcast. But I'm very business oriented and a little rigid. So in my podcast, out of every 10 people that I interview, I only, because I have a pre-screening, as you know, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. So out of every 10 people that I pre-screen, I only record three out of 10. Oh. Yeah. So, so and, and that's because I'm looking for specific things. And the primary ingredient, honestly, is authenticity. I want people that I can talk to that I'm going to be talking to them and not their representative and not their yeah. agent and not their mask or not their sales representative because they have something that they're selling and I can't get to the core, right? right. right? And um, I'm able to do that. So one of the reasons I wanted you to come on when we did our pre-screening was just kind of like, man, like we're just like having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that would be a really nice organic thing to share on the podcast. But as you know, it takes a lot. And sometimes you feel like you're going it alone because even like your closest family and friends that you think would be like really excited and listen to every yeah. episode. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. That, that's why I have my wife list too because I got friends that be like, oh, you got a podcast? Come on, man. Come on, man. Now, like, you know, I have it. You just acting like you don't know, or you'd be like, oh, I never check yeah. out an episode. Like, they like yeah. that. Yeah. And you have to really be in it for the reason that you're in it, which is the experience and what you're trying yep. to convey, right? Because mm -hmm. if you ever get caught up into the numbers and the statistics yeah. and the views and the listenership and the YouTube, and like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not fun anymore. No, you know? it's not. It, be, it yeah. becomes straight, a straight job. Then it's like, why don't yeah. or you or yeah. you be looking or you look and you be like, what do you mean? You only got 10, 20. What do you, this episode is is oh my they they don't they don't know no better. <laughs> All right. I sent a link to someone and they said to me, Oh, I wanted to offer you some constructive criticism. And then I responded, Nope, that's not what I'm doing. I'm like, whenever <laughs> <laughs> it's like whenever it becomes that where I have to like get the feedback from someone you know no no not but I appreciate it though but that's not what I'm doing on this one I'm just yeah. literally doing it I enjoy doing it and mm. I don't necessarily need the constructive feedback yeah <laughs> hey I, I, I'm doing me you you go do you I'm doing me <laughs> be great. Be great. <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah I mean like I guess my other question is, I know you have kids, so how old are your kids? Oh my gosh. So I have a 24-year-old son. I know mm -hmm. it's my Jamaican genes. I look a lot younger. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, <laughs> yes. I have a 24-year-old son, and I have a 16-year-old son giant. He's like 6'3". So when you said, oh, like 6'4", yep. yeah, he's 16 and he's like 6'3". Oh, man. Yeah. He, yeah. He's got more to go then. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Two sons love them to death. They're like my reason for um living and yeah that's that's my mom my 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 mom like that's my strife you know mm -hmm. <laughs> wrong with that. that's good that's good that's yeah. good yeah 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 nothing, nothing wrong with having two boys keeps things oh, calm around the house thank god because i don't even like to comb my own hair so i did not want to <laughs> afraid when i was pregnant like god please give me some because you know i don't like to comb my hair and I'm going to be too crazy strict with a girl. Like, she's going, why is my brother able to go outside? And right. like, <laughs> I haven't worked through my issues enough yet. So I was like, just let it be a boy. Just let it be a boy. Let it be a boy. Let it be a boy. <laughs>
Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, yeah. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate you stopping by. No Don't forget to listen to his podcast, Life and Times of Eric. What mm-hmm. what what do you stream on? Are you on Anchor? Or are you on um, uh, Spotify? What yeah, I'm on, I'm, I'm on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, pretty much everywhere. Um, I don't think I'm on iHeartRadio yet. I think that's coming later, but pretty much everybody else. The majority that you listen to, everybody's on. I'm on Anchor, Spotify, Apple, you know, the two three major big ones you can find me and like i said it's the life and times of eric uh t-h-e-l-i-f-e-x-t-i-m-e-s-o-f-e-r-i-c if you type in the life and times i'm the only one that pops up so it's great i just now need everybody to go check it out listen you know like i said with over 200 plus episodes there's something in there for everybody so yeah awesome and i'm gonna put that information under the bottom so they can check you out cool i appreciate that um, and, and, you know, get those numbers up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, look at my numbers now. I just look, well, actually, I looked at it the other day mm-hmm. and it was like 51% women and 49% men. And then I got an email the other day that I have like 75% male and like, wow. I was like, what? Because I feel wow. like I talk about a lot of girly stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But, but hey, yeah, the so men's, men come check it out, want to know what's going on. They do, because a lot of times, it's, you know, they can be anonymous, you know, yeah, yeah. With, with listening to subject areas that they may not necessarily feel comfortable, like, you know, in an open platform. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy that, you know, people listen and I'm hoping that they'll listen to yours as well. And, you know, from one podcaster to the next, keep it up, keep it going, because the yes. world needs what you, to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like we said before, consistency, consistency, consistency. Consistency is key. It is key. What a way to end this week's yeah. episode. <laughs> You've been listening to Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, Denise. As I usually say, take care of yourself and each other. Bye. You've been listening to the podcast. Let's talk about it. Feel free to support our podcast by selecting the sponsorship link on this platform. Drop us a line or even be one of our guests. Visit us on the web at www.imdenise.com to learn more.